Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Dr. Mark Gomez, but you can call me Dr. G, and welcome to Health360 with Dr. G. Today's topic, protect the skin you're in, moles, skin cancer, and more. Our skin. Skin is one of the most important organs in the human body and is essential to our survival. We are born with it, but do we do all that is necessary to care for it throughout our lifetime? May is Skin Cancer Awareness Month, and skin cancer is not only the most common cancer in the United States, but it's also the most common cancer worldwide. So what are the best ways to keep our skin healthy throughout the lifespan? Today on Health360 with Dr. G, we're talking about the best ways to protect the skin you're in, moles, skin cancer, and more. Again, my name is Dr. Mark Gomez, Dr. G, board certified internal medicine physician practicing out of Edward Hospital in Naperville, Illinois. You can also check me out on all the socials at health360podcast.com and also at health360wdrg. I'm so excited to have you here today. We have such an important show about skin, our essence. But before we meet my guests today, let me hit you with a quick disclaimer. The content of Health360 with Dr. G, a healthy driven podcast, is for your information and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. So let's get after it, y'all. I'm so excited to introduce you to my guest today. He and I go way back, hashtag Strict School of Medicine reunion 2004, 04, baby. I'm just so excited. I got to introduce you to my guy. So here it is. Dr. Ryan Freeland. Let me read you his credentials because Dr. Freeland's credentials run deep. Dr. Ryan Freeland, MD, FAAD. He's a board certified dermatologist. He's also founder and owner at Wolverine Dermatology. Dr. Freeland, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Dr. G. Such an honor to be here. I very much appreciate you. Hey, you bet. And I cannot wait to get granular with you on this topic. You know, Dr. Freeland, every comic book hero has an origin story. Give it to us, my friend. I already leaked the medical school thing, but give us again uh, where you grew up, med school, residency, and why this topic today about skin is so important to you. Absolutely. And thank you again for having me, Dr. G. So my story starts in Michigan. I grew up in Southwest Michigan in Portage, Michigan, a suburb of Kalamazoo, and went to Chicago, did my undergraduate training there at Wheaton College, later met Dr. Mark Gomez at Loyola Stritch, where I went to medical school. We graduated in class 2004. So basically, West Suburbs of Chicago for eight years, doing school things, came back to Michigan and finished my internship, which is really where I got interested in skin and and uh, dermatology and taking care of folks with skin problems. Essentially, I had a commitment to the Air Force. So I went through medical school on an Air Force scholarship and really enjoyed my time in the Air Force. And my initial three-year scholarship, which incurred a three-year service obligation, turned into 12 years in the Air Force. So a lot of stories I could tell, but I love my, love my time in service. Um, but essentially, I was an operational flight surgeon, spent a lot of time overseas in deployments, had a number of deployments in there, but ultimately knew I wanted to come back to dermatology. I love the variety of treatments. I love the variety of diagnoses. You know, it's lasers, it's lights, it's surgery, it's, you know, hardcore medicine, all kinds of things, a lot of preventative medicine. But I did my residency training inside the Air Force. Um, so I trained at Wilford Hall in San Antonio. Texas on active duty and finished my career teaching on faculty at Walter Reed in the dermatology residency program. I separated from the military five years ago and came back home to Southwest Michigan and opened up my practice like Dr. G mentioned in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So I've been in private practice for five years now, loving it, taking care of folks with all kinds of skin problems. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dr. Freeland. So awesome to connect. And again, I can't, as I said earlier, I can't wait to get more granular with you on this. So there you have it, everybody. You met Dr. Ryan Freeland, board certified dermatologist and founder and owner at Wolverine Dermatology. So here's how the show works. I ask the questions. Dr. Freeland's going to give some awesome answers. You know, you out there, grab a pen and paper. You know, something about writing it down creates that muscle, mind, memory, but also empowers you to ask questions of your physician. At the end of the day, we want you to have all the tools for continual and lifelong health success. So Dr. Freeland, when people go to our office, we call that the chief complaint. So here it is, the chief complaint, aka the question of the hour is as follows. May is Skin Cancer Awareness Month. So what should the general public know about skin cancer 
moles, and other common dermatologic conditions. So here's the first question for you, Dr. Freeland. Love it. Here it is. So why is it going to make the argument? Why is it important to take care of our skin? A great question, a great lead in. I think the skin in very rudimentary terms is a brick wall around our body. It is a barrier at very base function. And it's our skin's barrier, it's our defense field, it's our force field. So we gotta keep, take care of it to take care of what's inside. But we can also get into real problems if we don't protect our skin. May being Skin Cancer Awareness Month, like Dr. G highlighted, is we can get into problems if we're not protecting our skin with skin cancer, things like basal cell carcinoma, melanoma, and so forth. So have to protect that skin to protect what's within for sure. I love it. And let me ask you this final question. You know, and everybody else wants to know this. Every time I, I sorry, every time I see see patients in my practice, uh, you know, a lot of people always want the what are the what are the docs doing? What are the professionals doing? How do they, you know, practice what they preach? So here's a question for you, my friend. And you probably been asked it a million times because you're a dermatologist. So here it is. What should we be doing daily to take care of our skin? And are there any personal skincare recommendations that you do? my friend, to keep your skin working for you the best best way possible? Yeah, I get that question all the time. So a very insightful from you, Dr. G. Um, there are a couple of things that I tell almost every patient who asks about routine skincare. The first is I think people tend to complicate skincare. I think people tend to think if they're doing more things, more routine is better. More topical products, more cleansing, more washing, more this, more that. And usually what I do is I start at base one, square one, and tell people, you got to simplify things. If you want to do what the dermatologists do and the derm nurses do and the dermatology medical assistants do, keep it simple. I tell people all the time, you need three things for your skin. One, a gentle cleanser. Two, a good moisturizer. Three, a strong sunscreen. So good moisturizer, gentle cleanser, strong sunscreen. And if you ask me specifically what I do, I'll give you my secret. It's very simple. I take two types of sunscreen and use them regularly. I tell people all the time, you need one for dry conditions and one for wet or sweaty conditions because you need that water resistant sunscreen and you need to dry like a makeup style sunscreen. And I just tell people, pick what you like and go with it. We'll get into granular details about sunscreen and picking them and that sort of thing. But two sunscreens, one for wet conditions, like a water resistant sunscreen for activities and water and pool, ocean and surfing and fishing and all those sorts of activities. And then one for just around town. And other than that, it's easy. Just keep it, keep it easy. Cleanser, moisturizer. You know, uh, as, I, as you're telling me that stuff, I'm like, I'm doing, I'm like a mental inventory. What do I have at home? But luckily I'm very happy that I have a very good board certified dermatologist that, that's, that preaches the same message to me. It helps me with my skincare products. So I love it though, but I was doing a quick little inventory. I'm like, man, what do I have to get updated on uh, right now? Like, I love it. I love it. So thank you very much, Dr. Freeland. All right. So let's do this. Let me ask you a couple other questions. We're going to dive into some, some more pertinent stuff about skin cancer, but I just love some of these overview questions. So here we go. I like this one. What are some of the common mistakes people make when it comes to skincare? I think one of the most common mistakes people make is they complicate the routine. I alluded to that earlier. I think some of the other mistakes that people make um, is they, they equate spending money with quality of product. I tell people all the time, and I'm not here to ruin the industry or you know diminish anyone's capability or product or ability to sell to the public, but essentially you can get good, high quality dermatologic products, cleansers, moisturizers, sunscreens at very reasonable price points. You don't have to find that magic infomercial in the middle of the night and spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on skincare. So I would say, you know, a good cleanser, a good moisturizer, a good sunscreen. I mean, that might run you 30, 40, $50 for the whole set of things. So I see, I see people spend a lot of money. And then the other thing is I think people by and large, as we're talking skin cancer, I think people tend to not come in as soon as they need to. They see a problem, they kind of recognize it. They, they want to see how it goes and they'll wait a couple of months. They'll wait three months, but let that skin cancer grow six months. 12 months, Dr. G, you know, I, you and I have seen these patients in clinic and all of a sudden you have somebody with a bad skin cancer. So I, I, the party line for me and from the American Academy of Dermatology is, you know, if you have a question about your skin or if you have a growing, changing lesion, mole, bleeding spot, anything like that, by all means, 
come in, see your primary care doc, come in and see a dermatologist, get it evaluated. At least you have peace of mind if it's a benign thing or you're on the right track if it is a cancer or something like that. I love it. I always tell my patients like nothing is off limits when it comes to the conversations that we have. I'd rather know something that's going on that's bothering somebody that's on the top of their mind versus not knowing anything at all. As old saying goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So let me segue that, Dr. Freeland, into skin moles and skin cancer. You know, and as we're here in this month of May, talking about skin cancer awareness month and really having a really public voice, a, a, a call to action for people out there to, to make sure that they have the best options that are out there, the best opportunities for equity and, and skincare. Uh, I want to ask you these questions. So here we go. I like this one. Uh, just more breaking down some definitions because again, we can't assume that anybody knows uh, we can't assume that everybody knows everything. So, you know, Dr. Freeland, give us a breakdown of skin moles, in your opinion. What are skin moles? And then maybe lead us into what is skin cancer? Absolutely. Skin moles are groups of pigmented cells. And the pigmented cell in the skin is called a melanocyte, a cell that makes melanin, quite literally. When you have dense concentrations of those cells, it produces a mole. Now moles, generally speaking, tend to be shades of brown or dark, uh, dark brown, light brown to dark brown, um, but can be without pigment, can be clear, can be red in unique circumstances and so on. They can be flat or raised with or without hair. So broad definition there of moles as we tend to think of them. Now, one of the more dangerous skin cancers is a cancer of that pigment making cell called a melanocyte. We all know that we've heard this term melanoma. So a melanoma is a cancer of the pigment making cell. Um, this would be the most, one of the most dangerous skin cancers, certainly one of the most prevalent dangerous skin cancers out there. And to recognize that what we often tell people is you're looking for, yes, the ABCs, those changes in color, size, um, texture, those sorts of things. But I often train patients to look for an outlier. I tend to encourage patients on their once a month skin check to look for changes in the mole or differences between moles. What we talk a lot about in dermatology as an ugly duckling mole, an ugly duckling mole. Yes, like the children's story, an ugly duckling mole. <laughs> if it looks different or behaves differently, boy, it might be different. So the ABCs get really complex very quickly. I think the ugly duckling criteria, that is, does this mole match the rest of my moles, is a very applicable, very easy to understand criteria, which patients who are looking at their skin can apply. And I love how you said, you know, making sure that we are our best advocates, looking at our skin, taking the time to be intentional. Uh, you know, you've seen cases where, where things go overlooked or things are delayed. Or even as me, as I try to challenge myself to try to be the best doc I can be, I try to make sure when somebody's coming in for their for their physical, like literally the clothes, the clothes are off. I mean, let's just be honest. I need to see skin so then I know when, you know, if I got to look, look here, look there, all this stuff, but I got to see skin so I know that we're there because I know the importance of skin cancer and that why we have to have be very vigilant. Uh, uh, the vigilant is docs to be able to help out. So I appreciate you doing that. So let me ask you this, Dr. Freeland. Uh, there's a lot of FAQs, a lot of frequently asked questions out there when it comes to skin cancer. I get them. You get a ton of them. I usually just refer people right over to, to my dermatology colleagues because usually when I get a lot of these questions, it's, all, it's on the heels of uh, making sure that we're making sure that people's blood pressures are good, diabetes are controlled, talk about weight management, you know, lifestyle, stress, all that kind of stuff. And so I may have to kind of compartmentalize and say, you know what? I'm noting it. I'm going to note. I'm going to talk to my colleague my, from dermatology and get you over to them because I'm recommending you have an evaluation. So here it is. Here's the question. First one I like on this FAQ about skin cancer, Doctor Doctor Freeland, who is at risk for skin cancer? Well, the answer is everyone is at risk, Doctor G. As you know, everyone is at risk of skin cancer. Now the reality is different. Um, Different uh, phenotypes, different appearances, different races, different ethnicities are at risk of different skin cancers. To give you some sense, lighter skin patients are much more at risk of something called a basal cell cancer, which is a very common, the most common skin cancer and the most common cancer in the United States, basal cell cancer. Whereas more darkly pigmented patients are at higher risk of something called a squamous cell carcinoma. So squamous cell carcinoma has a much higher prevalence in 
uh, persons of color, to include a wide range of ethnicities. Now, when I say these things, you also have to understand that we as dermatologists talk about uh, sun sensitivities and photo sensitivities. So we don't speak so much in terms of ethnicities or races, but we really talk about sensitivity to the sun as graded on Dr. Fitzpatrick's skin sensitivity scale from a one to six, one being the most sensitive to the sun, six being the least. So if I were to reframe this from a dermatologist point of view, the Fitzpatrick skin type one and two, maybe even the threes are at risk of those basal cell carcinomas, also the squamous cell carcinomas. Whereas those darkly skinned individuals, more of a Fitzpatrick type four, five, or six are at risk of things like squamous cell carcinoma, as well as melanoma. Melanoma being a risk for all individuals because of the genetic basis of this. So a couple of takeaway points here. Everyone is at risk, yes. and there are both genetic factors as well as ultraviolet, as well as several other factors involved in skin cancer. Wonderful. Here we go. I like this next one here. Uh, Dr. Freeland, uh, how common is skin cancer? You know, you and I both said that, yes, we're, we, it's the most common cancer in the United States, most common cancer worldwide, but how common is it? Do we know, like, do we know any stats? Do we know, for example, like, you know, how many new cases are diagnosed each year, just broadly, you know, not necessarily based on like squamous cell, basal cell carcinoma, or even melanoma, but like more broad kind of stats on skin cancer. Absolutely. In preparation uh, for this podcast, Dr. G, I pulled some statistics from the American Cancer Society. The American Cancer Society did a, did a wide reaching study in 2018, and they found that nearly 4 million cases of basal cell carcinoma, 4 million basal cell carcinomas were diagnosed in the United States of America uh, calendar year 2018, compared to the number of squamous cell carcinomas would be 1 million. So 4 million basal cell carcinomas 1 million squamous cell carcinomas, and 92,000 new melanoma cases. So those are high numbers. And to put those numbers into perspective, what that equates to is approximately over a lifetime risk, approximately one in five is the risk, 20% risk for all ethnicities, all races, all Fitzpatrick skin types, as I referred to earlier, are at risk of making a skin cancer, one in five. That's very, very high. To break that down even a little bit further, when you look yes. at individual lifetime risks for different races or ethnicities, the American Cancer Society study went on to say that approximately one in 38 white or Caucasian people will make a skin cancer lifetime prevalence, one in 38 lifetime prevalence, one in 167 for Hispanic people and one in a thousand for African-Americans and other persons of color. So these are high numbers and everyone's at risk as we talked about, but the all comers risk for lifetime prevalence is actually even much higher. We estimate it to be approximately one in five, which is astronomically high. Wow. And that's why you get having this urgency in creating this, you know, and we'll talk about it a little bit, but, but, you know, so many more moving parts, you know, we need more things that need to happen, creating more awareness in this month of May, this conversation cannot die at the end of May. It needs to keep going year round. Would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. So May is Skin Cancer Awareness Month, which is really our kickoff to summer, of course, in North America. So we're talking about sunscreen. <laughs> we're talking about skin cancer awareness. We're talking about skin checks and so on. But we would love to be love to have this a year round conversation where we are dialed in and we can reduce these numbers in terms of prevalence and ultraviolet exposure. No doubt. All right. Let me ask you a couple more of these F uh, FAQs about skin cancer. So I like this one. When should someone start seeing a dermatologist for a full body skin examination? What should they expect when they see you in an appointment for maybe a bowl check and how frequently should such an examination occur? It varies is the easy, is the easy upfront answer. I will tell you there are easy categories. Um, those folks who have been diagnosed with a skin cancer fall under national cancer network guidelines and a wide range of recommendations in terms of skincare follow. Most of those recommendations revolve around every six months for the first two years after a non-melanoma skin cancer, a patient is going to be seen by their dermatologist, hopefully seen by a healthcare provider of some type and seen as a full body skin check. So once you make a skin cancer, fairly straightforward every six months for two years beyond that, annually for life. Now, if you don't have a history of skin cancer, but are a more high risk patient, that is perhaps you have a family history of skin cancer, like a melanoma, we still advocate a once a year check. Now, 
recommendations vary about when that skin check actually starts. Is that adolescence? Is that post-adolescence? Is that 16 years of age? Is that 18? And I think the experts disagree a little bit, but I usually talk to parents about bringing those kids up to speed and making them more and more health conscious themselves. So I usually tell tell and sell parents to bring children in, bring adolescents in once they reach that adolescent period. So it's probably the 14 to 16 range for me, but I don't think it's ever too young if you do have a risk of skin cancer. Now, the final category I would say is those who are at very low risk of skin cancer. I do advocate a skin check, but maybe after a, a uh, an initial check and risk stratification by dermatologist, it's reasonable uh, if at low risk to see that patient every two to three years. And I think a lot of us dermatologists kind of vary, but take those guidelines into, into, uh, into consideration from the National Cancer Network, et cetera, et cetera. But there's, there's no hard and fast rules about how often someone is seen who is at very low risk. So generally speaking, we're gonna follow those patients at high risk a little bit more frequently, at lower risk, certainly less frequently, like every two to three years. All right, I like that one. Let's do a couple more of these ones and we're gonna talk about some sunscreen. So I like this one. Um, you know, What are the symptoms of skin cancer and what does skin cancer look like? When should somebody be alarmed as they're doing their checks? A good question because it varies by race, ethnicity, and uh, pigmentation. Mm. Essentially, in a lighter pigmented individual, we often focus on color, color and color variegation, numbers of colors, color changes, et cetera, et cetera, from brown to black or brown to red or variegation with multiple colors, brown, black, and red, that sort of thing. We tend to focus on colors, whereas in pigmentation, in and uh, folks of pigmentation of any shade, what matters even a little bit more than color change is texture change. So I think we're really learning more about what that presentation actually looks like. But I think as, as individuals look at their skin and check their skin, hopefully once a month, they're looking at their skin to see those both color changes and symptom changes. Does it itch? Does it bleed? Does this thing look like the rest of my spots? Is it the outlier or the ugly duckling? So I would say in summary, you're looking for color changes. You're looking for comparison to other moles or spots or lesions just like it. And then you're also looking for those symptoms. Does this spot itch? Does it bleed? Um, does it cause me irritation or heaven forbid pain? Common misconception is that skin cancer has to be painful. And the honest answer is usually skin cancer is not painful. Correct. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you for breaking that down. Let's do one or more of these skin cancer questions. It is, but it's a perfect segue into us talking about sunscreen. So here it is. I like this question. Uh, we, what should we know about cumulative skin exposure? Uh, you know, we used to think that the majority of UV exposure happened early before age 18, but that has been proven false. So how are we addressing exposure risk in our later years of life? Boy, I hope we are. And I hope the, the, uh, the public service message is out. Thanks for helping get the message out, Dr. G. So we have to protect ourselves at all ages and all stages of life. From very early on, newborns, young ones, even to the most elderly patients, we need to protect ourselves. So there are varying theories about when the most damaging sun is. But I will tell you, um, we often in dermatology talk more uh, about time of day and as well as the periodicity of the sun. Let me break this down. Yeah, we we think about different skin cancers as different, um, the, the risk is differential according to how much sun someone sees. So if someone hypothetically is at the equator and being blasted by the sun day after day after day, month after month after month, year after year after year, that really sets you up for things like squamous cell carcinoma, that consistent ultraviolet exposure. Whereas we in North America are more under this latter sort of exposure for most of us at the Northern climate side, I live and practice in Michigan, and we get this periodic sun. It's like we get three, four, five months of warm weather and sunshine and that periodicity of blasted with the sun and then long cold winter and then blasted with the sun and then long cold winter, that sort of undulating period of sun exposure really sets us up for that basal cell carcinoma, which is why we estimate it's actually four times more prevalent in the United States than others. So certainly there's a risk from um, cradle to grave for infants to elderly, but we also think about those peak hours, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., as well as the seasonal sun changes. We got you. All right, let's do this one. I like this sunscreen. We got to talk about it. Here it is. It's like, it's like, you know, it's like you can't do a skin show 
without talking about sunscreen. And some people don't love it when we talk about sunscreen. I know I try to preach it like crazy in my practice. And of course, I, tur- uh, I send people over to my dermatology colleagues and I know they're preaching it too. The, the, like, people might think we're in like some sort of like cult, a sunscreen cult. That means like the name, like sunscreen cult. And our motto is don't get skin cancer. Uh, I, just, I, just made up, I just made up a group for us. It's, it's pretty cool. I'm I like I'm it. In. I like I'm it. In. We're in it. It's, yeah. it's got to start someplace. I love it. So here it is. I like this. So a couple of FAQs about sunscreen. And then I got a special section, special game that I want to play with you guys, play with you, Dr. Freeland, on Health 360 with Dr. G. Here it is. So what, you know, what is sunscreen? What does SPF mean? And what SPF should I use? So good questions. I get these frequently. SPF is a sun protection factor. It's very important to understand this is a mathematical relationship. It is calculated in a laboratory based on some observational data. Basically, we are comparing sun protection factors for different products. um, And we are comparing how long does it take to get a sunburn with a sunscreen versus how long it takes to get a sun sunburn without the sunscreen. And that's where we get the sun protection factor or the SP. F. Now, SPF is not a linear scale. It's a logarithmic scale. This is a very important concept. SPF is on a logarithmic scale, which means that curve changes. And for you mathletes out there, for you engineer types, you know what this curve looks like, but it kind of bent, bends um, like a boomerang. Um, and the reality is when you get to the higher SPFs, like 30 and beyond, you don't get much more protection. Let me give you some stats. So with SPF 30 or higher, which is the American Academy of Dermatology's recommendation. So 30 or higher, there's magic to that number. We protect ourselves from approximately 97% of the sun's harmful UV rays, UVA and UVB. And a side note on UV, UVC never makes it to the atmosphere. So ultraviolet is... A, B, and C, even I can remember that. So C never makes it to the atmosphere, never makes it through the mm. atmosphere. We're really worried about UVA, UVB to protect ourselves from 97% or more. We're at SPF 30 or higher on that logarithmic scale. So routinely, I tell folks, the only place you're really gonna get into problems is with the cosmetic pharmaceuticals, some of those moisturizing products, some of those makeups who might have my terminology, a whiff of sunscreen in them, SPF 10. SPF 12, SPF 15, a good start, but not comprehensive enough to protect you from the majority of those sun's harmful UV rays. All right. I like it. Thank you for breaking that down. Here's the next question. I'm putting you on the spot. I love this one. Who puts on sunscreen more reliably, men or women? What's your take? Oh, man. Oh, man. I think I'm going to get myself in trouble. <laughs> I, know. I, know. I, I will tell you, I pulled, and I, if I pulled, um, a group of my dermatology nurses, experts in the field have been doing this years and years and years. Mm. They would emphatically say the women are so much better and I'd probably have to agree. So I don't mean to pander to anybody. (laughs) I'm probably going to get myself in trouble if I said otherwise, but I do agree. I think by and large uh, for us guys, we are just, I mean, we're tough. We're not thinking about these sorts of things. We don't want to do these things. We're not used to or accustomed to, or maybe even culturally, we're not used to including things on our skin, whether it's a moisturizing cream or a sunscreen or, or anything to protect ourselves. So I think by and large, it's much more um, acceptable for females to wear sunscreen, much more culturally acceptable, therefore perhaps arguably appropriate or that sort of thing. So I think females do a whole lot better job. Um, interestingly, the differences between females and males, I recently read a report, all these reports yeah. coming out right now with the, the May Skin Cancer Month, but um, women 49 and younger are at a higher risk of melanoma new diagnosis. And that switches right about age 50, age 50 and beyond all commerce, all ethnicities, all races, men tend to be at higher risk and those curves diverge as time goes on. Really interesting. And that may be our evidence there. I know there are a lot of confounding variables there that could explain that, but women at risk or at slightly higher risk of melanoma earlier in life, men at much greater risk of melanoma 50 and beyond. That might be our answer, Dr. G. I know. And I would say, fellas out there, you heard it here on Health360 with Dr. G. You heard it from Dr. Freeland. Put that sunscreen on your skin. Ladies, congratulations. Keep doing it. All right. I like this question here. What are the most overlooked areas where people should apply sunscreen? And how do you put sunscreen on hard to reach places like your back? (laughs) <laughs> I'll start with I'll start with that second question. First. I love it. So if, you, if you haven't brought a friend or a spouse or a significant other to the beach, um, 
there are different tools to put this on. No kidding. You can buy these off the internet. You can Google this sort of thing. There are a million makers of these sorts of things. Um, I have a nurse that preaches a home remedy for creams and medications as well as sunscreen. She says a wooden spoon with some saran wrap on it. I know that's kind of corny, but if you're applying <laughs> it, you go to the beach, the spoon with saran wrap. Um, hard to reach places, of course, to answer your first question, Dr. G, where are those hard to reach places? Where do we have trouble? Where do we struggle? I would tell I would tell you for a lot of people, middle of our back, because a lot of us can't reach it because of flexibility. Um, other areas, top of our scalp for the gentleman, top of our scalp, top of our ears, behind our ears, back of the neck, those are tricky spots. And a lot of people miss the top of the hands and the top of the feet. I see a lot of skin cancers on the back of the hands and arms and people just neglect these areas. Perhaps they put sunscreen on their face, but not their hands and arms. Um, and I can tell you from experience, your dermatologist hasn't done this well all the time. I can tell you an anecdote that I went jet skiing one time and I covered my whole body in sunscreen. And what did I forget? My feet. And I had burned a little red tomato <sighs> feet. So I learned my lesson. So you ask me, I've got this strong anecdote. I remember those tops of my burned feet. So um, there are a lot of common areas there, but uh, top of the scalp, back of the ears, top of the feet, be the most common. I, I got to tell you, tell you a story. My, my wife and I uh, were out in Napa Valley a number of years ago. And here's me trying to be like the cool, the cool like husband. Actually, we were engaged at the time. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure we were engaged at that time. Now I'm trying to remember everything. I'm like, where was it? It was like a memory. It's like, it's like a blur. But I remember this exact instance. So me trying to be cool to impress my amazing wife, I decided to rent a convertible while we go wine tasting. And, uh, you know, top down. And I had shaved my head recently. Sunscreen everywhere except the scalp. And the burn was real. Uh Oh, it was, yeah. it was bad, but I, I was looking good though. I had my sunglasses on and everything, but uh, there were a lot of laughs and everything, but I learned my lesson. So love the story. Love the anecdote. All right, here we go. Well, I'll do, let's do two more of these sunscreen questions. And I want to get into the lovely game that I got for you. So here it is. Um, what barriers, what are some barriers that you see or pushback regarding effective sunscreen use? I think one of the first barriers is people will ask me if it's dangerous is are the filters or the chemicals or the ingredients in sunscreen dangerous? I hear that all the time, probably from a maybe more of a convinced standpoint. Like I already believe this. I'm not going to use sunscreen because I think they're dangerous. And I will tell you the, the research as well as the American Academy of Dermatology uh, implores is that, that a systematic review happened from the FDA in 2019. We reviewed all the filters with uh, sunscreen, those are the chemicals that actually block or shield the sun's harmful UV rays. And products that are out on the market are by and large safe or entirely safe. So I don't really buy that myth. I try to break that down break that down for my patients. Um, and the other one is probably simply access maybe to good sunscreen. Not that it's not out there, but people may not have it available. Like they get in that situation where they rent the convertible like you did, and maybe they don't have the right sunscreen for the face, or maybe they just have that greasy water resistant product, or maybe they have a, a sunscreen that's a couple years old at the bottom of the purse kind of thing. And maybe they just don't think of it. So I, I, I try to, um, I tell, I tell a lot of my patients that, um, Repetition is the mother of learning. So I tell people sunscreen, 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 have them place them, put them in bags, put them in beach bags, put them everywhere, put them in your console, um, keep them by the nightstand, all that kind of thing. I'm just kidding with that last one. But the <laughs> idea is the more sunscreen you have available, the more likely you are to use it. So not that we don't have access to good sunscreens, you may just not think of it. But the more I talk about sunscreen at each visit, the more the patient thinks about that, I think the better they do at applying the sunscreen. Thanks. So let me ask you this last sunscreen question. And I get this quite, quite a bit. I have um, many Many patients in my practice uh, that are African American, um, darker darker complexions, and I when I bring up the topic of sunscreen, I get met with sometimes with some hey you know there's not sunscreen for 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 our people, not sunscreen for Black people, people Latinos, not sunscreen. So and the pushback might be well the sunscreen may be so chalky, so I don't want to put it on. So what's your kind of advice out there for people that are darker complected as far as skin cancer protection and sunscreen use? It's a great question. I'm glad you asked it, Dr. G. I get this question quite a bit too. Um, number one thought, number one response for patients who ask these sort of questions is to take a look at sunscreens now. These are not the sunscreens of your, your mother and father. I mean, we have come a long way in developing these molecules and these filters and incorporating these sunscreen products, these filters into things like tinted products, makeup style products, a range of darkly uh, tinted products, to basically apply to 
skin of all color, where yes. whether it's pigmented or non-pigmented. So there are pigmented or there are um, specific sunscreens that are tinted that I really recommend, highly recommend for my patients of color. The mm -hmm. other thing that I often tell folks regarding sunscreen is there are a lot of really nice kind of bougie, fancy molecules out there, things that you can't even feel. You're not even going to feel that zinc oxide. I mean, there are literally sunscreens that we sell in our office, Dr. G, that are called unseen sunscreen on any skin type. You can't see this stuff. You can't feel this stuff. So really sort of rocket science has gone into some of these sunscreens and very, very high quality products out there. I just tell people, just take a second look, just take a second look. And if you're not convinced, take a long look at a tinted sunscreen. Love it. There we go. I like it. So here we go. We're joining here. This has been such awesome discussion so far. Uh, joining with my old Loyola Street School of Medicine classmate, Dr. Ryan Freeland, board certified dermatologist and owner and founder of Wolverine Dermatology in Michigan. Uh, I've came with a game for you, you know, as we're prep as a prep for today. And, and by the way, Dr. Freeland and I had talked about getting together on Health 360 with Dr. G for like four or five months now. So this is the real deal. So I've had all this time to come up with an amazing game for you, my friend. So here it is. It's called the protect the skin you're in, the fun in the sun game. So here's how it works. And you at home, you can play too. You can kind of guess what Dr. Freeland's answers will be. Here it is. Here's how it works. In this section, Dr. Freeland, I'll state an activity. Then you state the appropriate skincare measures to be undertaken. Here we go. Wedding season. Here we go. First question uh, as it relates to the skin. What are the skin do's and don'ts before the big day? Well, I probably think the do's and don'ts are much like anything else. Nothing drastic within a few days of that big day. So I tell people, avoid the laser hair removals, avoid the chemical peels, avoid a lot of those heavy, harsh, and deeply penetrating um, skin routine techniques um, or procedures. So I tell people at least a week, nothing within a week. So even if you get like a light burn from a chemical peel or, you know, wax um, of upper lip, wax of eyebrows, these sorts of procedures, super common. I get these questions all the time. I tell people, give that skin at least a week to heal just before that big day. So uh, always recommend giving a couple of days. Yeah. Excellent. I like that one. Here we go. I like this one here. Should I put sunscreen on before or after makeup? And can sunscreen be reapplied over makeup? It's a good question and largely preferential. My party line guidance is yeah. sunscreen or medication always down first underneath that makeup. But can sunscreen be applied on top of makeup? Preferential choice, but I would say yes and safely it can be and actually would encourage it for folks who are out more than two hours. As sunscreen, we'd recommend be reapplied every two hours if you're out in direct sunlight. Excellent. I like this one. And then we're going to switch up. Here's the next out. Here's the next fun in the sun topic, the category. Here it is. Outdoor activities and vacations. Here we go. Motorcycles or cycling enthusiasts, what should they be doing to protect their skin while they're out there on their mode of transportation? Well, it's hard to seek shade, which is the number one recommendation for the American <laughs> Academy of Dermatology. That one's tough. So I would say it is sun appropriate clothing. So for folks riding motorcycles, cycling long distances, wearing loose fitting or appropriate sun protective gear, of course, helmets, not my area of expertise, but certainly endorse them, sunscreen, sunglasses, and sun protective clothing for those activities. I love it. Excellent. Here we go. Next topic here. Still same theme, outdoor activities and vacations. Other athletes and sports enthusiasts. So whether you're a baseball player, soccer player, maybe you're, maybe you're a parent watching your kid's ball game, uh, what should athletes or sports enthusiasts be doing in this fun in the sun game to protect their skin? Similar. Okay. Uh, similar to my previous answer, okay. usually for uh, games, of course, you're going to be in a uniform and you probably can't deviate from that very much. So sun appropriate clothing might be out the window, but I would say for sunscreen, you're probably reaching now for more a water resistant sunscreen. We can't say waterproof. The FDA doesn't mm -hmm. allow makers of sunscreen to say waterproof, uh, technical difference there, but we say water resistant. Now the water resistance usually rated out to 80 minutes, eight zero. So if you get to halftime of a long soccer game, or you know, get done with nine holes of a golf match, that sort of thing, it's time to reapply. But essentially I encourage patients who are really athletic or outside or just your weekend warriors who are gonna sweat, maybe garden, walk, that sort of thing, to seek out water resistant, sweat resistant sunscreens. And there are truckloads of them. They are typically marketed as active sunscreens, sport sunscreens, or a lot of manufacturers I see now coming out with play sunscreens, which highlights a broad spectrum of activities. 
All right, here we go. I like this one here. Uh, let's change topics a little bit. Burns. Let's talk about burns. So um, let's do this one. Um, what is the difference between first, first, second, and third degree burns? And regardless of type of burns that sunburns that people get, what should people immediately do if they get a sunburn? Well, burns are really tough to treat and hard to endure as we've all been um, in that situation before yeah. on some level, but a first degree burn is a partial thickness burn. That, that is, it does not go all the way through the skin layers. Typically we're talking about epidermis, maybe just to touch into the, the upper dermis. So essentially there are two layers of the skin, the inside layer being the dermis, thicker layer holding the hair follicles, the blood vessels, the nerve endings, the oil glands and so forth. And then the outside layer, the epidermis. So partial thickness burn would get through the epidermis and maybe into the upper levels of the dermis. A second or third degree burn is going to be a full thickness burn. And we're talking about the full thickness of the skin, of the dermis. And those are obviously much more concerning, much more worrisome. Now, what to do when burned? The first thing is, as you and I learned at Loyola in the burn center from Dr. Remember Gamelli and company days. all yeah, those years those ago, days. is to stop the initial burn or stop the insult, stop the onset of the burn. So get out of the sun if it's a sunburn. Um, get away from that heating pad or yes. that uh, curling iron as a, as a reflex that's going to be an easy one. But essentially stop the burn process. So the first thing is stop the burn. The second thing is cool that area off. We often recommend cold or at least cool baths, cool washcloths if you can't to get to a bathtub or shower. Um, pain relievers like aspirin, naproxen, Tylenol, Motrin, these sorts of things in anticipation of the pain, um, but also keeping something cool on the skin, wet compresses, cycling them through, not to chap the skin, but just to keep the skin cool and stop that burn process. Other things that I found really helpful for patients, thick moisturizers or emollients, Vaseline, Aquaphor, CeraVe, Cetaphil, get something on that skin to soothe the skin. We tend to recommend these types of products over uh, pain relievers like benzocaine or anything that ends in cane tends to be irritating to the skin, especially when it's been burned. So predominantly and primarily get out of the sun, stop that burn process, cold or cool shower, cool bathtub, and get some thick cream on that skin immediately. Wonderful. All right, let's do this last section here. I'm going to skip around a little bit because I want to get to some Miss versus facts, but we haven't even talked about tanning. So here's our, here's our quick, you know, quick uh, uh, blast on tanning, but here it is. Here's a question. Um, <laughs> Dr. Freeland, um, what is the recommendation here about tanning and are tanning salons safer than natural tanning? And what if someone's adamant on tanning? You know, what can be done after the fact? How do you approach tanning in your practice? Boy, it's tough. And I, I try to make a connection with a patient because I know folks who come in tanning, um, there's a cultural moray there. There's a way that they want to look. There's an appearance that they're going for. There's a cosmesis and so forth. So I try to connect with the patient before I just sort of lambaste the activity or, or discredit the activity. Yeah. I try to really encourage patients uh, to think about the risks of tanning. Artificial tanning, so much higher risk than natural tanning. That is that artificial tanning bed or tanning booth is going to deliver high dosages of ultraviolet in a very short period of time, very intense ultraviolet pulse there. So that'd be much higher per minute, per hour, per time unit. So definitely avoid the tanning bed for health of your skin and to protect that skin, but also avoid long periods or any periods of tanning the skin because any tan is sun damage. A lot of people draw the line arbitrarily at a sunburn versus a sun tan. They say, oh, well, I didn't burn. Therefore, I didn't damage my skin. And to that, I retort, no, 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 no. Any tan whatsoever is damage to the skin. Now, if someone is tanning or has a history of tanning, there may not be much that can be done as a water under the bridge to reverse that, but there are things that we can do to treat that. Dermatologists have a number of treatments to include topical creams, to include light therapies and blue light therapies to reverse those photo damaging uh, years, um, not to entirely prevent all that could happen to the skin or erase that history, but at least to minimize the risk of skin cancer going forward. All right. Thank you. Right, there we have it. I love it. So I hope you scored well on this fun in the sun game. Let's do this, Dr. Freeland. We're going to go through some myths versus facts uh, right now. And myths versus facts, of course, uh, something that we do in each episode of Health 360 with Dr. G. And it's really all about setting the record straight. So I'm going to say this statement. Dr. Freeland is going to say myth or fact. We're going to go through this like as rapid fire as we can. This has been awesome, but I love it. We have to set the record straight. So here we go. Myth or fact. Please explain. Here we go, Dr. Freeland. First statement. If I put sunscreen on in the morning, I'm covered all day. Myth or fact, please explain. 
myth. You got to apply that sunscreen every two hours, especially if you're out in the sun. So once a day, not good enough. I want you to reapply at least an ounce of sunscreen every two hours. All right, here we go. I like this one. If I use an oil suntan lotion that says SPF 15, I'm okay. Myth effect, please explain. Myth. I think that sunscreen is a little bit too low on that SPF factor. So I don't think you're okay until it's 30 or above and you're reapplying. So as we talked before, that logarithmic curve, we really want to see SPF 30 or higher, no matter which type of product you use. Cream, lotion, spray, powder, anything. All right, here we go. I like this one. Sunburn continues to burn your skin even after getting out of the sun. Out of the sun. Myth or fact, please explain. Well, I think that's a fact, at least for a few minutes, because that burn process is still ongoing, as we recently alluded to. So that's a fact. That's why I say one of the number one recommendations once you have a sunburn is to stop the burn process, cool that skin off immediately. Wonderful. Here we go. I like this one. You can have melanoma and not know it. Myth or fact, please explain. Fact. Most skin cancer is not painful and oftentimes melanoma goes undiagnosed or undetected because it's in very difficult places to find. So oftentimes the back of the scalp, in between the toes, the bottom of the feet, cracks and crevices, sensitive parts of our body. So absolute fact, you can have a melanoma and not even know it. All right, here we go. I'm going to actually take this one. I like this one. This is the little Dr. G participation. Love it. Here we go. Here's a statement for Dr. Sheen. Mr. Brett, please explain. This is myself to myself. Here we go. I don't, I love that. I like cracking up trying to do this. I don't need sunscreen on cloudy days. That is a myth. You should apply sunscreen on it every day. It doesn't matter if there's clouds or not. You could still get rays, harmful rays of UVA and UVB rays that can penetrate and get in your skin. Skin. So I tell people, it doesn't matter if it's rain, sleet, snow. <laughs> it's what, you know, one of those things, Dr. Freeland. I'm like, put it on all the time. What's your take? I highly endorse that too. Now I live in a cold Northern climate. So um, <laughs> I would say maybe not in the snow, but boy, three seasons in that, with that ultraviolet index hitting four or higher, absolutely sunscreen on um, rain or shine, cloudy or not. Wonderful. Thank you. I like this one. Here's the next one here. A sunscreen with a high SPF won't protect my skin longer. Myth of fact, please explain. Boy, there is a lot of controversy around this one, but we think current science says that that SPF 30 and the SPF 90 are going to protect you for the same exact amount of time, just to different percentage filtration or reflection of the sun. So a higher SPF will not protect you for a longer period of time. All right, here we go. I like this one. This is for you. If I have something that looks like a pimple that won't go away, then I have skin cancer. Myth or fact, please explain. Well, you might. That's a trick question. I think Dr. G is throwing a trick question. At you. But <laughs> if there is something in question and a pimple does not heal, boy, a non-healing ulcer or a non-healing pimple on a sun-damaged area, head, neck, face, and arms, via the chest or via the back, shoulders, et cetera, is a skin cancer until proven otherwise. So I will say, uh, to err on the side of safety, I will say fact. Because our mantra in dermatology, boys, that is skin cancer until proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. It's our job in dermatology to prove it otherwise. With a bias. I love it. Here we go. I like this one here. This is for, for the fellows. I told my convertible story, but here it is. This is for you, Dr. Freeland. I need a hat, even if I'm using sunscreen. Myth or fact, please explain. Fact. Double coverage, always better. I can make all kinds of sports insane. analogies here. We could talk football, basketball, <laughs> tennis, uh, double coverage, tag team, WrestleMania, whatever you want to think of. Uh, Physical blockers like hats, sunglasses, um, even the physical blocker in a sunscreen, as well as the chemical sunscreen is your best coverage. So even if you're wearing sunscreen, our highest recommendation, put that hat on, get some loose fitting sleeves as well. All right, here we go. We'll do a couple more of these. I like this one. Here it is. Skin cancer does not run in my family, so I do not have to worry too much about sun protection. Myth or fact, please explain. Oh, that's a definite myth. Now, folks, that being said, Folks who have a family history of skin cancer, particularly melanoma and a lot of non-melanoma skin cancers, we think they're probably more or they're at higher risk or they have more risk of skin cancer. But that does not mean that those folks without uh, genetic background, genetic basis or family history are at no risk, possibly lower risk, but not no risk. I think that's a myth. All right, here we go. I'll take the sex with this for Dr. G. If I didn't wear sunscreen as a kid, starting now won't help protect against skin cancer. And I would say that's a myth. As we talked earlier in this podcast, we're talking about protecting the skin throughout the lifespan. It's better to start now than never. Uh, don't delay. And again, if anything happens with your skin, 
don't be afraid to talk up to your primary care physician who can refer you to your dermatologist. If you have a dermatologist already, talk to your dermatologist, but skin sunscreen can be applied and should be applied as early as you can. What's your take, Dr. Freeland? Absolutely. Completely agree. And I tell people all the time, it's never too late to do the right thing. There you go. I like this one. This is a good one. We'll do, we'll do two more of these. I like this one. An eight ounce tube of sunscreen should not last through your entire week-long beach vacation. Myth or fact, please explain. Oh, I think that might depend on how much beach time or how much golf time you have. But <laughs> recommendation for a full body application of sunscreen is approximately one ounce. Now, how much is that? If you fill a shot glass or a cupped hand with about the volume of a golf ball, volume of a golf ball or approximately uh, one full shot class, that would be a total body application. So for the average size adult, I would say it that way. So one ounce times an eight ounce bottle, boy, kind of depends on how many golf rounds you go on vacation. So maybe I'll play right. the fence on that one. Dr. I got you. Here we go. I like this last one. This one's for you. Uh, you want to buy the highest SPF available for babies and young children. Myth or fact, please explain. I would say facts just to stay okay. safe. You want to keep that SPF high, certainly higher than uh, an SPF 30, as we already discussed. We recommend uh, routine uh, sunscreen application to children six months or older, but six months or younger, obviously just keep them out of the sun. Six months or older, SPF 30 or higher, but if you can find a 60, 80, 90, or even a 110, 120, go for it. There you go. Thank you, Dr. Freeland. So there you have it, everybody. Miss versus facts. That was awesome. That was definitely rapid fire. Love it. So we got about five minutes left. Dr. Freeland, we called it in the beginning. We called the chief, chief complaint when somebody comes into our office. And then we call it the assessment and plan. That's when we give somebody a diagnosis a treatment plan, and most importantly, we schedule that follow-up. So Dr. Freeland, what are several take-home points that people should get from today's show when it comes to protecting the skin that they're in? Given the reality that this is Skin Cancer Awareness Month, that it is May, and we are heading into hopefully what will be a warm and sunny, very enjoyable recreational summer for all of us and all of your listeners, all of your followers, is we need to protect our skin. Um, all races, all ethnicities, um, any, any skin type, or pigmentation type. Um, and we need to do that with high grade SPF. We need to take precautions like seeking shade. I tell people all this all the time, go out and live your lives, go have fun, go be outside, go enjoy. And I still tell people, boy, you know, and to, to quote a Dr. Freelandism, you want to be actuarial about your son, but not actuarial about your fun. So go live your life. Just protect yourself. Yes, hats. Yes, sunscreen. Yes, loose fitting clothing. Yes, uh, sun protective gear for any activity out there. But you got to protect your skin and you want to do that. You don't want to ease into the sun. You don't want to tan before you burn. You don't want to go to the tanner before a vacation where I tell people protection is where it's at. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dr. Friedland. And before we get to my final thoughts, let's do a section that we do on each episode of Health 360 with Dr. G called Listener Healthy Oh Yeah Content. So I genuinely enjoy hearing about your journey. I don't have a content today to share, but I genuinely enjoy truly hearing about your journey. And with your permission, I will read it on the show. Simply message me across all social media at Health 360 with Dr. G. And who knows, your story may be a catalyst for someone else who needs to hear it. So my final thoughts are this. When it comes to protecting the skin that you're in, the best approach is to have a preventive mindset. We know that skin cancer is a major public health problem and the voices to address this reality must be louder. We need a continued, quote, it takes a village effort, end quote, healthcare organizations, physicians, all levels of government, community, faith-based, nonprofit organizations, families and individuals to increase awareness of skin cancer. Speaking on behalf of my fellow physicians, let me leave you with this call to action to reduce skin cancer risk. Increase opportunities for solar protection in outdoor settings. Number two, I should say, should have said number one. Number two, provide information about limiting UV radiation exposure. Number three, promote policies that advance the national goal of preventing skin cancer. Number four, reduce the harms of indoor tanning. And number five, strengthen research, surveillance, monitoring, and evaluation related to skin cancer prevention. You know, if we simplify and unify our messaging, then we can achieve a much greater impact. So I want to thank my guest today, Dr. Ryan Freeland, board certified dermatologist, founder and owner of Wolverine Dermatology, Dr. Freeland. Thank you, my friend. This has been awesome. Thank you. Such an honor to be here. Great to reconnect with you, Dr. G. I 
I'm proud of you and uh, privileged to be on your program. Thank you very much for having me. Well, it's been my pleasure too. Hey, everybody, you've been listening to and watching Health 360 with Dr. G, a healthy driven podcast. This episode is written by Mark D. Gomez, MD, and Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Producers are Tiffany E.R. Gomez and Sarah Zwack. Audio and video production specialist is Mike Paskey. Copyright 2022, Edward Elmer's Health, all rights reserved. For more awesome health information, visit me at health360podcast.com and follow me across all social media at health360, Dr. G. This is Dr. G signing off. And until next time, peace out. Mm-hmm.